Welcome to the Hit Like a Girl podcast. This is High Tea with Grace, where we spill the tea on HIT. I'm thrilled to welcome Tatiana Fofanova, CEO of Coda Health. Welcome to the show, Tatiana. Thank you, Grace. I'm so excited to be here. Tell me about the path that brought you to Coda Health. Well, um, the path is full of uh, pain and um, the desire to work with a lot of vulnerable populations. So I think, you know, when it comes to advanced care planning, uh, quite simply, it's the it's the process of planning your care in advance to give your family and your providers the instruction uh, they need to make those decisions for you when you can no longer voice those decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And I think every single one of us has had this sort of experience. It's a, it's a core life experience, right? Whether it's you know, a friend who's gotten ill or a family member who's gotten into a car accident or simply approaching the end of life. Uh, these conversations about quality of life are, are pretty critical. Um, I used to work in uh, pediatrics at uh, Texas Children's Hospital where I was on um, teams that worked with children with a number of incurable diseases and really understanding the the dialogue between providers and uh, caregivers and families and their children and how that decision-making process um, happened made a huge impact on me. I no longer wanted to be a clinical scientist, which is where my training was, um, because I felt like I could make more of an impact by uh, streamlining a lot of those conversations and making them more effective so that people could live the kind of lives that they wanted to live. When, when do you recommend that people reach out for advanced care planning? So that's a great question. So advanced care planning should be done by anyone over the age of 18, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We focus uh, at CODA on the senior population. And when I, when I bring up my experience working with, with children, um, as a clinical scientist, I worked with both children and the, their families and seniors and their families and found that uh, in seniors, the dynamic between um, the, the dependent and the decision maker is switched. So suddenly the child mm. becomes the parent and the parent becomes the child. So true. But that dialogue is never reestablished and neither is the, the sort of legal relationship and the decision-making framework. And so a lot of parents and their children, when they approach that phase in their lives, right, uh, are left unprepared. And so what happens when people don't have advanced care planning is, you know, people feel like they know what kind of uh, care their, you know, their parents or their partner might want um, in case they couldn't, you know, communicate it. But the reality is, unless that conversation is clinically guided and well-documented, the likelihood that you, for example, choose what your parents would have chosen for themselves is only about 50%. And that is, of course, devastating to families. Um, it's heartbreaking. It breaks families. It breaks bank accounts. But it's also excruciatingly expensive for health systems and hospitals. The delivery mm -hmm. of unwanted and inappropriate health care costs mm -hmm. them over um, over $100 billion each year. Oh, my goodness. That is in an insane number. Um, so, you know, how does advanced care planning help better prepare the patient and help better improve the care given to them? Yeah, absolutely. So patients with advanced care planning uh, have higher satisfaction with their care, right? Mm -hmm. They have higher rates of palliative care and hospice use. Mm -hmm. As we know from both the literature and from clinical practice, uh, palliative care increases rates of remission because you're actually able to manage the symptoms of your patients, right? Uh, and hospice care, contrary to popular belief, actually extends the life of the patient. It has a higher quality, mm -hmm. patients with on hospice have a higher quality of life and live longer, right? And then in case of uh, an event where a patient does pass away, families have a much better grieving process. And what tends to happen is the bulk of the decision-making burden falls on women, right? Women tend to be the caregivers. They make most of the healthcare decisions in the family. And when there isn't this framework and this instruction manual for those caregivers, they also bear the burden of the decisions that they've made. And so it's an emotional toll that is very, very difficult to, to capture. 
Wow. It's so true. Women are, you know, have that burden of that decision. And if there's not a plan in place at the end of the day, they're the ones that bear the brunt of what it looks like to not have that plan. What we hear a lot in the industry of talk about health equity, you know, what does health equity look like um, in advanced care planning is, are there health equity considerations that you need to keep in mind? There are many. There are a lot of health equity considerations to keep in mind. So traditionally, planning for your future health care, so advanced care planning, has been uh, farmed out to estate planning attorneys. And, you know, if you are the kind of person that doesn't have an estate to plan, which is most of us in the United States, um, you are sort of left to your own devices to either talk about it with your physician or with your family. Right. When you talk about it with your family, you don't always know what to discuss and in what level of detail and how to make that, um, how to document it properly. And unfortunately, most physicians don't engage in this conversation until it's far too late because they often don't have the time, the training, and the tools to navigate it appropriately. Uh, and so what happens is, you know, the rate of advanced care planning in the United States is, is really quite bluntly abysmally low. And, mm -hmm. and what also happens is that uh, minoritized populations, uh, you know, uh, Black patients, Hispanic patients plan at less than half the rate of, of their white counterparts, um, which is a huge equity of access issue in terms of quality of end of life care and quality of care during serious illness. Um, and what also happens just to keep on adding layers to this. Add all the layers we want to know. <laughs> yeah, is, um, you know, a lot of the folks we work with are older adults over the age of 65, right? Um, in that generation, men tend to be very uncomfortable discussing these, these concepts. And so advanced care planning engagement in men is so much lower than it is in women. And, you know, people deserve to stay in control of their health care and of their quality of life for their entire lives, right? And when it's farmed out, what happens is the vast majority of people don't have access to that. Medicare acknowledges that this is a, a huge problem. So in the last five years, they've been prioritizing advanced care planning initiatives, really locking it into metrics for providers and payers. You know, programs like HEDIS, BIPSI, uh, Primary Care First, VBID, all of these have come out in the last five years, right? And it's meant to stimulate uh, these healthcare providing organizations to bring this conversation into a clinical setting. And unfortunately, most, most healthcare organizations are struggling to do it at scale. Mm, so it seems like the solution really would be to be able to do this at their primary care or at a place where they're getting care so they have better access to this type of um, opportunities. Well, access is definitely mm -hmm. a, a huge barrier. Um, behavior is also a huge barrier, right? And the mm -hmm. time of our physicians. So um, as you very well know, uh, providers and the healthcare system overall has a lot to do, right? And it is very difficult to introduce this in a clinical setting, not just because of um, time, but also because of authority bias. So especially folks from uh, from marginalized communities and uh, from lower socioeconomic statuses will um, find it uncomfortable to engage in this conversation with a doctor face-to-face -face is the first time they're, they're exploring these concepts, right? Um, and so you, what, what happens is when it's introduced in a primary care setting is frequently people just lock up Mm, and they don't feel comfortable answering it as much as they would if it was, you know, just on their own. Exactly. And mm -hmm. that's why at CODA, you know, what we realized very early on is that um, when advanced care planning is introduced asynchronously, uh, we have this suite of digital tools uh, coupled with care navigators and discussion navigators um, that people are able to explore it at their own pace without fear of uh, authority bias or limitation of information. And we're able to, in this asynchronous approach, um, raise engagement rates in all of those populations and, and basically level the play playing field. So in uh, a study we did at, at Houston Methodist, 
we were able to get equal engagement rates in white patients, black patients, male patients, female patients across socioeconomic status, because in many ways, you know, software doesn't uh, really care um, what your background is, and you can take all the time you want. And what happened was so many patients, after they explored all of these different care scenarios, quality of life scenarios, were able to come to their physicians armed with their own understandings and preferences and feeling like they they were on the same conversational plane as their physician when, when, when describing what it was that they wanted. That is really encouraging and empowering to think of patients as collaborators in their own care. Are there ways that you incorporate patient and caregiver insight into the innovation process that really helps you best, um, best develop these technologies for their use? I am so glad you asked that. So in uh, older adults, especially, there is this trope that older adults can't use technology, right? Or that they don't want to. Fundamentally, I vehemently disagree with that. I think older adults are really bad at using technology that was developed for a 25-year-old. And user experience is often massively overlooked in this age group uh, and massively overlooked when it comes to patient experience overall. You know, we... Uh, as consumers in the rest of the world prioritize user experience and we are very choosy. We will we will dump a product as soon as it is even slightly difficult to use, right? But in healthcare, that often just gets overlooked. And so what we do at Coda is uh, we we prioritize the user experience to probably almost in a ridiculous degree. It's it's the first and last thing we, we, we wake up and think about in every morning and every evening. Um, but what that means is that, you know, hands down, we have the most pleasant and engaging user experience in this field, right? And that's what people want. You know, they don't want to be trapped in like this morose conversation where something is droning on them. They don't want 23 pages of documents, right? They want it explained simply and cleanly in an interface that they feel capable of navigating, that they feel empowering navigating, right? And what that also means is that when patients start our platform, we have a 91% completion rate for an average age user that is 78 years old. It, it is possible and beautiful to design products for the people that use them. I just think it's very frequently um, seems to be deprioritized in healthcare. Truly, truly. I, I'm wondering what rules or policies now, you know, directly impact the advanced care, care planning industry? Um, what things do you have to keep in mind when you're developing technologies, when you're implementing them and more? Well, on the policy side, there is, there has been a lot of work that's been done. Um, there's still quite a bit left to go. So as I mentioned, CMS has been pushing out all these uh, performance metrics and initiatives and programs that are bringing this conversation into the clinic, right? Which is absolutely wonderful. Patients aren't really getting it uh, elsewhere, so it needs to happen. Um, and Medicare does cover advanced care planning, um, but unfortunately, Medicaid does not, right? Which again, causes this barrier to, uh, to equity of access in uh, serious illness care that disproportionately affects the poor, right? And on the Medicare side, as you know, um, you have Medicare that's split into value-based care versus fee-for-service. On the fee-for-service side, there's still copay, right? Mm -hmm. And that can be a huge barrier to patients, right? Especially if they're already hesitant to talk about it, then charging them to talk about it is just, it, it doesn't make it easy. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. um, and right now there is bar bipartisan bills uh, out there trying to remove the copay associated with uh, with this and really pushing to drive equity of access across all so socioeconomic strata. That's so awesome to hear that that's out there. Do you have an idea for when that might come around or are you just kind of keeping an eye out for it? Keeping an eye and promoting it. There's an organization mm -hmm. called CTAC, the Coalition to Transform uh, Advanced Care, and they are a phenomenal uh, policy organization. Um, they're the ones that are really pushing for, for this to go through and reporting on it and all of that. Um, the hope is sometime this year. I know that there is um, quite a bit more attention on, on this space, especially after you know recent, um, 
global healthcare events that have disproportionately affected older adults. I was going to say, how did the COVID pandemic impact the way people see advanced care planning? Interesting is on the patient side, before, during, and after the pandemic, 80% of patients have wanted to talk about this with their doctors, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but prior to the pandemic, uh, many organizations, there wasn't as much pressure, regulatory pressure on them, one. Um, but two, many organizations, healthcare providers and payers um, re really relied on physicians to do the bulk of this engagement, right? When the pandemic hit, um, they couldn't do that, right? You can't just bring in a patient to have a conversation about advanced care planning. That's an infection risk, right? And you you can't necessarily prioritize those conversations, even though in that point in time, they're incredibly critical and people wanted them even more. There's more desire for them. Um, you can't prioritize it over the COVID wave that's coming in, right? There's so mm -hmm. much to do, right? And so there was a simultaneous uptick in demand and a, a, a destruction of the ability to meet it, right? Which is where an asynchronous solution, a digital solution like ours really, um, really got a lot of traction. It's also when uh, that time period is when many health systems, you know, all the things that were technically working, but kind of kludgy and frail really broke down. And many health systems and payers and organizations started looking for innovative solutions and, and really opening up the aperture for the types of products and solutions that they were willing to, to test and bring on. That is really fascinating. That is very interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'd love to move on now to your personal life. You are a CEO of Coda Health. Uh, what are some things you do personally to work your best and make a difference? Right. So this sounds probably a little silly and cliche, um, but I have started meditating. And, you know, the way, the way I've integrated meditation into my life is um, because I realized that as a CEO, if I'm stressed and overwhelmed, so is the rest of my team. It really sets the tone mm -hmm. for the whole organization. Mm -hmm. And we already work on very stressful topics, right? So one of the best things I've realized I can do for my organization and for uh, the services that we provide is maintain my own self of calm and bring that to work right? Because when I'm calm and I am measured and I'm logical, people feel more secure and f fostering and facilitating um, and encouraging others at the organization to also prioritize and facilitate <clears throat> their own sense of calm passes that on to our patients as well. Mm, very true. Do you have kind of grief counseling or anything else that you do as a team that helps manage some of that? Uh, pain from talking about this topic all day. What are some strategies you do as a team? So we systematize um, the sharing of patient stories. Talking about it helps uh, within our within our company uh, whenever possible. We also express our gratitude weekly. I think that staying grateful keeps you grounded. Uh, every member of the company, every single person, has the opportunity to publicly share the things that they are grateful for at work or otherwise. Um, and to share the patient stories. Um, the other thing that we've, you know, we have an unofficial company value that basically says, you know, at Coda, we go to therapy, uh, very much encouraging people to do so. We will not um, foist that upon people, of course, right? But uh, we've very much encouraged people uh, to prioritize their mental health as uh, a component of their regular health. Um, and one of our company values that we try to live and breathe by is take the keys. So just like you wouldn't let a friend drive home after a night at the bar uh, or really after a really bad breakup, right? We take the keys and we notice that our peers are getting overwhelmed um, and we really just shoulder that burden. So, and another key thing to remember for us is that um, our, our navigators and the the rest of the organization, the rest of the people that we that we um, work with, we very often don't navigate the conversations with the patients themselves. We empower them to navigate that conversation with their families because, at the end of the day, you know we're a well-educated um, stranger, right? 
the conversations, the decision-making that they should be making is amongst their loved ones and their physicians. Mm, very true. Very true. And I love that you really incorporate compassion as a culture there. Uh, what are strategies that you use personally to face obstacles in life and in business? I sleep a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, it, again, it, it sounds very silly, but um, there were times in my life where you know, I'm a very passionate person. Uh, people who work at CODA are very passionate and empathetic people. We, um, we make sure of that. We hire them to be passionate and empathetic people. And, you know, that, that is a wonderful thing, but what it can also mean is that people will have a habit of, of running themselves dry sometimes. Right. And so really encouraging that, um, that balance, that prioritization of sleep and health and, and mental wellness, uh, so that we can properly and effectively do the things that we are passionate about. Mm, I love that. We all need to sleep more. Hear that? <laughs> Everybody, you need to get some more rest. If you could give some advice to your younger self, what would that be? If I could give advice to my younger self, I would tell her to listen to her gut more and listen to other people less, especially those people who seem to have just a lot of quote unquote, constructive feedback that really is not all that constructive. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of criticism and not a lot of building. It's very, very easy um, to, to criticize and bring down and poke holes. Um, and the people that you should surround yourself with, the mentors, the friends, the peers, the colleagues that you should surround yourself with are those people that help you build, not those people that point out all of the issues with nothing really beneficial or encouraging to say. Mm, that is so true. I definitely ha know, have faced those people in my life as well, and I'm sure all of us have. As a female CEO, do you have any interesting learnings or sharings you'd like to, to share with us? Yes, definitely. So we are in the middle of an economic downturn, right? And what that means is that um, per perseverance is really key. So, uh, you know, venture capitalists, private equity firms, investors. Um, unfortunately, if you if you look at the statistics, only two percent of venture funding is currently going to women founded companies, right? And that jumps up as soon as there is a uh, a man on the leadership team, right? And this is really insane to me, right? Because all of the research suggests that women-led companies are actually more profitable. Now, one of the reasons that they're more profitable is it's so much harder to, to get that investment, to get that growth and support, right? And so the women-led teams, you know, they go through, they go through the ringer, right? And I think that is an important thing to keep in mind. I can't tell you how many times I've been told that, oh, you're a woman CEO, it must be so easy for you to raise money or to capture investment or to capture leads um, because there's just so much initiative about bringing uh, that equity into the, the space, into entrepreneurship. And it just, it just, it's mind blowing because it's, it's the exact opposite. Those initiatives exist because statistically and, you know, out in the world, that's just, you know, what people say and what people do don't always align, right? A lot of folks still see women as the riskier investment. So I think it's it's very important for other women that are starting um, companies and that are passionate about uh, reforming or innovating in their respective spaces to pick the people you work with excruciatingly carefully, right? People mm. who walk the walk and don't just talk the talk, right? Who aren't um, you know, just really interested in 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 vocally uh, supporting women in that space, but also supporting them with their money, with their check sizes, with their networks, who are who are there for it, right? And um, and and really building an an intolerance for anything less, right? Because the entrepreneurship journey journey is is very difficult, and it is more difficult for women, and it is even more difficult for women and people of color. Right. And we have to be intolerant of 
of those people who are who are not willing to walk the walk, right? Who are just uh, money in or no support, right? They need to be there with you to grow your network, to grow your your company in its its entirety. So be very very careful, very choosy of who who you bring along for the ride, and make sure that they're they're there to support you and your dreams and your vision over anything else. To finish this conversation off right, where can our listeners find you online? Well, they can find us at codahealthcare.com. Um, I'm happy to send along my contact details as well. You know, we're we're um, passionate about working with not just healthcare organizations, but nonprofits that want to bring this to vulnerable populations, um, as well as individuals that would like to share their story about how uh, advanced care planning, planning for future care and illness has impacted their lives. We really want to be a a voice uh, in the space and really not just a service. So that's terrific. Now, before I forget, did you happen to bring tea with you today? We did. Awesome. Tell me about your mug. So um, this mug is was purchased for me at the Seattle Museum of Natural Science by my parents when I was 11 years old. And I became obsessed with ancient Egyptian everything and archaeology. Uh, I ended up going to, to college and double majoring in archaeology and biology, which is why I ended up in medicine. Um, and it's always been a life dream of mine to, to see one of the original civilizations, right? It, it just, it's something that had fascinated me from a really, really tiny age. And uh, I've kept, I've held, held on to this mug, mug for over 20 years, right? And this past year, uh, my new husband um, surprised me by- Congratulations. <laughs> by, by booking our honeymoon in Egypt. So we spent two weeks uh, going down the Nile, visiting all these archeological sites. And I kid you not, like the very first temple we arrived in, both 32 year old me and 11 year old me were just bawling, just uh. so grateful to have, it, it's just, you know, achieving that childhood dream and um, really, really healing that inner child that, that, that was 11 years old and really wanted this. I, I think I, I didn't realize how valuable and how um, just amazing and, and beautiful it is to just fulfill those childhood dreams that you thought you outgrew. Oh, I just love that you gave us the opportunity to celebrate that moment with you. <laughs> Truly special. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It was so nice to have you, Tatiana, to talk about advanced care planning and more. And I just really appreciate having your voice here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Grace. And thank you all for joining us too. Check out the Hit Like a Girl podcast website and YouTube page for more great guests like Tatiana today. Cheers.